when we played Australia, at 10 minutes before kickoff, one of the committee members came to me and said, Barbara, Barbara, where's the teapot? Where are the teacups? I have to get everything ready. And it was like, hmm, I'm out to play in a quarter of an hour. <laughs> The idea that women would go out and have muddy knees and dirt over them just wasn't ladylike. Before football, I was your typical housewife. I stayed home and cooked and cleaned and looked after the children and my husband went to work. And so I knew nothing about football. Some women approached him and said, look, we'd like to put a team in the first women's league that started. And he said, oh, go and ask my wife. She'll crash and bang into anything. <laughs> and that's how I started to play. I love the freedom of being able to run down the pitch as fast as you could to be able to jump up and, you know, if you accidentally headed the ball and it went back in the, in the net and it was just, yeah, I, I fell in love. I remember coming off that first game and thinking, I'm going to master this game. For most of us growing up, to play sport, there was very limited choices. For the women suddenly being able to go out and use all parts of their body and run freely, the sense of confidence it gave them in their bodies, we had so much fun. In Auckland, we started with 10 teams in 1973. By the following year, it just exploded. The reaction from men was always really mixed. You had the men that were pro, they're the ones, like my husband, that were very positive. There were people like Ken Armstrong, who was a tremendous influence. And then, on the other hand, you had the men that, oh my God, you know, women playing? This is disgusting, you'll get hurt, or this is a man's game, you shouldn't be invading our territory. We got an invitation from Hong Kong to say that the first Asian Women's Cup would be held in Hong Kong in 1975, and would New Zealand like to um, participate? What we had to do to get there, one, we all had to contribute $100, and then we had to help raise the money to pay for the airfares. We ended up walking up and down the street with little boxes to say, please, will you donate money? And I can remember going into the pubs with about three of us and saying, um, 20 cents a kiss. <laughs> so you know, it wasn't that pleasant. <laughs> but that's, that's how we got to Hong Kong and, um, and we won. The reaction when we got back was quite amazing. There were a lot of people at the airport to meet us. The press were there, the television were there. Most of the media reports tried to emphasize our femininity, ensure that they mentioned that we'd have sweethearts or husbands. So there was that angle or lens that the media used to sort of ensure that the public were happy that we were capable of attracting men. You could do some, <laughs> you could do some corners. You could do some corners, Lawson, and Trini could go and goal, or, or Jack could do some well, corners, and goal, you, so. could <laughs> you could head. Oh, oh go Jackie. Your turn, Jack. Oh, oh, go, go Trini. <laughs> Was there any other option playing football in our house? It would definitely have been difficult because that was our whole social environment. It was our discussion point. Uh, it was our love. Our house was kind of the central point for everything football related. So people would come before training, they'd stay after training. There was always a lot of people in the house. She was very much my impetus to play. She started doing something really cool. So. I wanted to be like my mum and do that too. By the time Shell got to 11, she was allowed one more year of grace as a 10th grade. And then 
there was no longer anywhere for her to play because the Auckland JFA would not allow mixed football. It wasn't suitable for an 11 and 12 year old to be playing with you know, women of up to anything up to 40 years old. So I went to the Human Rights Commission to see if they could do anything about letting girls and boys play together. The Human Rights agreed and said that they have to be allowed to play, but the AJFA totally ignored that ruling. So it wasn't until 1985, which is, you know, 12 years after it had been first mooted, that girls got to play with boys. As a 10-year-old, you don't appreciate what your mother or your, your parents are doing to try and protect your interests. And all I could think about was, I can't play football. And that was the big tragedy for me, um, not the sort of process that went behind that. So, you know, you get a bit older and then you realise how important access to the game is. Michelle and I were the first mother and daughter combination to play for a national team in the whole world. Mum was a defender primarily and I was a midfielder, but the time we played together in the national team and beat USA, the only time New Zealand has beaten the US women's team, we played in defence together. And in their record it's got, you know, America lost 1-0 <laughs> to New Zealand. And when you get a little country like that beating a huge big country, it makes no difference whether you're a male or female team, it's still important we would have been ranked fourth in the world during those times. And then in 2000, things rapidly went downhill. All of the delegates from the various women's associations voted to merge with Football New Zealand. A lot of the investment got taken out initially of the women's game and put into the men's game. And so, for example, I played in a period of three years where we only went on one international tour. I asked our coach of the time, so what was on the schedule? I needed a, an operation quite badly and I was willing to delay it if there were some significant events. And his answer was there was, there was nothing planned for the next couple of years. You know, you take a, a, um, an untried male and you put all the effort into him, well, that's fine. They become really, really good. Why can't you put the same sort of effort into a female? So you've got the opportunities for them to reach the top and become good. The women were just being ignored. Oh, this will be funny. I think this will be a good idea. <laughs> this will be very funny. <laughs> it will be. This is I'll take him on you. Go and take no, him on. This will end, end up very funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was always going to happen. It was always going to happen. I think anyone who knows my mother is quite inspired by her. She is someone who really gets things done. She fought so hard to get young girls to continue to play with boys as long as they could. And I think that really helped develop the girls' skills. And I think it also started to open opportunities in terms of publicity for girls that, that maybe the traditional options weren't the only options available. I think a third of the player base is now girls. Going down there and seeing that nearly is on a gender equal basis, it's fantastic. The thing I would like to say to my mum, but also to my dad, who's obviously not here, is thanks for the, the support they gave us as young women, because that wasn't always the case. We were so fully supported to play sport and do whatever we wanted. When I first started, I was pretty useless, technically, but I remember going out onto the stadium and looking around, and seeing the crowd, and thinking, I belong here.